Shannon Mugridge, did I get it right? You got it. Yes, you got it. Shannon Mugridge served in the United States Navy. Mm -hmm. I could just stop right there, but I won't. For seven years, he served in the Navy and has been married going on 17 years with three kids, ages 11, 10, and 8. Shannon is a big advocate for the for Be the Match since donating bone marrow to a 12 year old child 10 years ago. You have to hear about that. Shannon mm -hmm. is also a proud advocate for military causes such as the Chad O Foundation and any other ones that come along calling, uh, come calling. This comedian, Shannon Mugridge, is also a co-owner of Turn To Entertainment that puts on local comedy shows around Texas. What this means is he tells jokes and his wife handles everything <laughs> else. Shannon has been traveling nonstop the last year, headlining across the country fe and featuring for some amazing well-known acts performing in over 40 states, like he said. Shannon's comedy is a mix of family life, military experience, and the humorous mistakes he made along the way. The comedic style, he has can be summoned up as tackling the dark, darker side of being a parent. So now, welcome to Comic Spot, <laughs> Shannon Thank Mugridge. You. Woo! Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Today, what city are you in, Shannon? Uh, right now, I'm in Zion, Illinois. It's about 30 miles or 30 minutes, 30, well, about 45 minutes west of uh, Chicago. Uh, we're almost in Wisconsin. Uh, you take it right out of the house and go about a mile here in Wisconsin. No way. Have you ever yeah. gotten so stoned that you wound up in the wrong state? Not yet. <laughs> we'll give it some time. I've only been here two months. So uh -oh. it, it is funny, though, because there's a recreation area down the road here. It's called the Bong Recreation Center. And I, I really want to know how I got that name. And I, <laughs> it, I, I bet it's a boring story. I, I bet it, I'm going to be highly disappointed when I find out. But every time I drive by it, I want to take a picture and make a meme out of it. But I'm usually too high to remember. <laughs> <laughs> so. so let's talk about little Shannon growing up. I know <laughs> right now you're a dad of three in a marriage 17 years. You were in the military for 10 years in the Navy, right? Seven years, yeah. Seven years. So let's talk about who you were growing up. You were, how many brothers and sisters what were you like in your family what was your family life like uh i always talk about my family being like the alternate universe of the wizard of oz because uh like i said my mom was a stripper they hung out with bikers my dad was a truck driver uh she uh the bar that she worked at forever the strip club she worked at forever was owned by a gay couple two men and uh, so I always used to joke that, uh, you know, every time there's a knock on the door, it was either a stripper, a biker, or, you know, a, so it was always someone, there's a two thirds chance of someone uh, either borrowing or returning my mom's boots, you know, <laughs> but uh, it's, uh, I always said it was like the alternate universe of uh, Wizard of Oz, you know, you answer the door, it's uh, bikers and strippers and gays, oh my, you know, you don't know, you know, you never know what it's going to be. It was a, I always look at my life, my childhood and look at my kids' childhood and I'm like, yeah, no, uh, they're not growing up like that. Uh, I mean, I was buying weed for my dad at 14. Uh, we always, I mean, when your mom's a stripper and there's always strippers at the house and you're a teenage boy, you got a lot of friends that come over. Yeah, they, they love hanging out at your house. They really do. Yeah, you don't, you think you're popular. You, you figure it out later. <laughs> oh my gosh, they come over and then they spend a lot of time in the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> debriefing uh, <laughs> no, i had a friend tell me once that he was never going to use the shampoo at my house <laughs> <laughs> yeah my mother worked in a, a bars my whole life mm -hmm. my parents were very good alcoholics i think yes. those kids drove them to that how many brothers and sisters do you have well that's weird. i have six brothers uh, but uh i have five older brothers and one little brother but i grew up with my little brother i didn't grow up with the other five i know them somewhat uh some of them a couple of them i know better than the other ones but 
my mom had the first five boys and then uh, got divorced, I think, in 1971. So I think it was what it was. And then she left Missouri and left the five boys with the dad. And she moved to uh, Houston. And that's where she met my dad. And that's where and she had me and my brother. And so we grew up uh, with uh, my dad and uh, my mom. And so we got to know him a little bit. But it was mainly me and my little brother. We were uh, thick as thieves all the way into our mid-20s. Uh, <laughs> Matter of fact, when I joined the Navy, I had to, I joined the Navy at 27 and um, because I had to do something. I, I, it was uh, at a point in my life to where I had to do something. I was going to wind up in prison or dead or, you know, and so I tried to go Marines first and uh, the Marines told me that I got in too much trouble to be a Marine. And I was like, I thought that was a prereq, you know, it, uh, <laughs> you know that doesn't make any sense. And so I told them, I don't want to go Army and the Air Force isn't going to take me. And the guy's like, go to the Navy. They take anybody. And so I ended up doing seven years in the Navy. But uh, up until that point, though, I was in trouble with the law all the time. I was addicted to drugs. I was, uh, uh, and I always used to say, to everybody, I've had people ask me, so what, what drugs did you like doing? I was like, I never met a drug I didn't like. You know, it's, uh, it's, <laughs> it's easier. That, that there's, most of them aren't in memory enhancing drugs either. So it's kind of hard to <laughs> put, a, put a finger on which one. But no, nah, I've uh, been sober now. Fuck, a little over 20 years uh it's uh it's one of those things i mean don't even know, i still smoke weed i always get uh i don't drink but the only thing i do is smoke weed and uh you know i have friends that are completely clean and they're like you're not sober it's like i'm a hell of a lot better than i was <laughs> you know? we'll leave it yeah. at that so yeah but, there's that whole debate you know whether or not you're clean and sober if you take marijuana yeah or cannabis or whatever they call it. We called it Mary Jane in the 60s. Yeah. Well, the thing <laughs> is, the ones that get on you about, oh, you, you're putting chemicals in your body. It's like, dude, you're, you're drinking coffee and smoking a cigarette while you're telling me that. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, man. Coffee is, it changes you just as much. Oh, yeah, definitely. I've seen people so hopped up on coffee, yeah. <laughs> their teeth shatter. Oh, yeah, and also hide, hide a cigarette smokers pack of cigarettes for a couple hours and see how they act. <laughs> yeah, or take away a cell phone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you went through high school, and then after that, you... Went out into the big wide world and got yourself in a lot of trouble. Well, I moved to Austin, Texas is what happened. Uh, it's uh, I moved to Austin when I, I moved from Odessa, Texas to Austin, Texas. And uh, yeah, when I was 19, I was living out in Spicewood, Texas. And uh, that's uh, I ended up working at Willie Nelson's ranch for a little bit. And uh, I got to hang out at his place and smoke weed with him. And he's a really really cool guy the person you see on tv is the exact person he is when you meet him man he's just like he found out me and my brother were living in our car uh we were we were i say we were living in our car we're living in a 76 dodge charger so it's like having a mobile home you know it's a uh, this thing was massive man but we were living in our car out of lake travis and i was working for willie and he found out about it and so he let us stay on his ranch until we could get a place and his ranch has uh an old movie set on it it's called luck texas it's uh barbarossa was filmed there redheaded stranger um uh, the butthole surfers did a video out there they do a lot of movie stuff out there and it's just an old movie set it's got the uh the saloon the whorehouse the oh, i'm sorry the brothel uh but uh it's at the pharmacy the church all that and it's for you know western movies but he told us we could sleep there until we got a place. So one night we sleep in the brothel, one night we sleep in the bar, one night we sleep in the church, you know, it was really cool. They even set up a little outdoor shower for us, put up a platform with a hose and a curtain so we could shower after work. So it was really cool. At 19, it was cool. At 46, I'd have been like, this fucking sucks. I don't like this. I don't want to do this anymore. You know, <laughs> but at 19, it wasn't that bad. But no, I did. Oh, go ahead. So then at some point, you're not living there anymore. Then what did you do? I just kind of bummed around Austin uh, for about seven, eight years. Uh, and when I say bummed around, I mean bummed around, man. I uh, I didn't own a car for seven years. I finally got a car after I got everything straightened out. And when they were driving down the road and my brother's like, you know, you don't have to take the bus route. You have a car. I was like, I don't know how to get around. <laughs> me, I've been riding the bus for eight years, man. I don't know how to get around Austin without taking the number one route. But uh, 
Man, I just I just messed around, got in trouble with the law a lot, wound up on probation, almost wound up in prison. I got busted with an ounce of weed in 2000. And, uh, you know, now you, kids these days like an ounce of weed, big deal. No, in 2000, an ounce of weed is a lot. Hey, you're going to prison. Uh, they're going to get you for distribution. They're going to get you for everything they can get you for. And they tried. They really did. Uh, but they ended up uh, giving me two years deferred adjudication. And so I had one year to be good and if I was good for one year, then I was good to go. If I got in trouble one time in that year, then I went to prison for two years. And so as soon as I got off that, I started talking to the, well, I started talking to the recruiter actually while I was on probation. And uh, he's like, is there anything that will hold you back? I was like, well, I'm on probation. He's like, you can't join the military on probation. You fucking moron. He's like, you gotta, once you're off paper, come and talk to me. And so that's exactly what I did. And uh, it took me about a year to get in. I had to go to MEPS 10 times. Uh, the 10th time I finally shipped out. And because it was always something every time that they would call me up to MEPS, they'd find something in my background that I'd have to go get paperwork to prove that it was taken care of or I'd have to. It was always something, man. And uh, I told my wife, I was like, I don't think I ever got in the Navy. I think I just went to MEPS so much. Finally, they're like, just send this dude to Great Lakes. Just get him out of here. Just go. He's never going to stop coming back. Just send him. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, man. Then, when you went in the I, Navy, what was your job description, Shannon? I was an interior communications electrician. Uh, so if basically, if it had electrons flowing through it, I worked on it. Uh, anything to do with communications gear. Um, uh, yeah, it's, uh, phones. The uh, thing is, uh, my shop, we own the, the PA uh, for the ship. And I was on an aircraft carrier on the USS Nimitz. And uh, I know the, the USS Nimitz. That's oh, yeah? been to Portland a lot. Oh, yeah. No, yeah. They're up in, uh, I think they're up in Bremerton now. Uh, I think that's where they're at now. Um, I was in, when I was there, they were in San Diego on North Island. Uh, but uh, one of the jobs we had, though, is the ICs, is we were in charge of the PA. So if there was a retirement ceremony, if there was anything to do, any uh, retirement ceremony, a promotion ceremony, award ceremony, we always had to bring the PA and set it up. And then they did their ceremony. And then we broke the PA down and brought it back to the shop. And I did that for three years, lugging a PA around an aircraft carrier for three years. And uh, whenever I left the ship, I turned to my chief and I said, I'm never setting up a fucking PA again. I swear to God. And now that's I own three of them. And that's uh, seven years in the Navy, advanced electronics training. I even have an associate's degree in electrical mechanical technology. Uh, I was about a year away from a degree in electrical engineering when I decided to do comedy. Everything that I went through in the Navy for advanced electronics. And the only thing I took away from is how to set up a PA. <laughs> so the tax, tax dollars hard at work there <laughs> where all did the navy send you no, i went around the world twice uh it's a uh, see on deployment i went to hawaii twice we went to hawaii there on the way out and the way back and then see guam malaysia hong kong uh yeah guam malaysia hong kong where else did i go malaysia, japan uh, go to japan uh australia um Huh? Yeah, Bahrain, Dubai. Um, I've been to London. I've been, uh, man, I'm trying to think of anywhere else the Navy sent me. They sent me all over the place. The yeah, we uh, had to float off the coast of North Korea whenever they were acting up once. Uh, that was fun. Uh, yeah. went to we went to River City, which is, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with River City, but uh, River City is a condition on the ship. If they, if they call River City to a certain level, then there is no outside communication whatsoever. The ship is in the dark, basically, because they don't want the world to know that we're there. And so they had us, uh, North Korea was acting up. And so we had to go float off North Korea for two weeks. And so I couldn't email my wife. I couldn't call her. I couldn't do anything. And uh, we got done with it and we were leaving. And they're like, hey, we're going to Guam since, you know, we're giving you all free port. And I was like, all right, cool. So I went to go call my wife and I told her, I was like, sorry, I haven't called. She's like, oh, I already know what's that. She was friends with the captain's wife. So she knew about it before I even knew about it. And she wasn't allowed to tell me. <laughs> <laughs> no. Oh my gosh. So what's your favorite city that you visited, Shannon? Oh, Perth, Australia. Easy, hands down. Why? Yeah, it's because it's Australia. <laughs> it's, what about Australia? Man, I had so much fun there, man. It, it's, it's one of those things. It's like uh, being from Texas, uh, I, it's just kindred spirits. Uh, I went to Perth. And also I have friends in Perth now that I know through comedy. And uh, one of them's told me, he was like, no, if there's anywhere in Australia that would compare to Texas, it would be Perth. It's uh, it's just, it's the westernmost part of the country. It's, uh, you know, the cattle and all that kind of stuff. But I just... It was so cool there because everybody, you know, everybody wants to drink sailors under the table. That's the goal. Whenever you, any, any port you go to, they want to drink the sailors under the table. 
And like I said, I joined at 27. And I had a lot of drinking in my background when I joined the Navy. And I'm from Texas, so I got that Texas pride. I can't get drunk. Drink. I don't drink anymore because I drink too many people under the table. <laughs> but uh, no, I just had a blast there, man. I did. Uh, there was. I was there for four days, and I think I was hungover for five. <laughs> you know, so it's a. Uh, yeah, I had a blast. It was so much fun. So much fun. I, my parents went through the Holocaust. Oh. And so a, they put me a, in Germany. Mm-hmm. And so I'm there and I'm like, I'm going to drink these German soldiers under the table. They're going to be so sorry. All right. (laughs) Yeah. So you're in the military and then you get out and now you're on stage and giving opportunities to other comedians doing 40 different, you've done 40 states this last year, right? Yeah. Take me through getting out of the military to doing comedy, if you will. Uh, it wasn't instantaneous like that. I uh, I got out and when I got out of the Navy, I was like I said, I was uh, my whole goal. My whole plan was to get out of the Navy, become an engineer and just, you know, get rich being an engineer, uh, you know, but uh, I uh, I got out. I got into the University of Texas uh, when I got out and that was like my dream school. I always wanted to go there my whole life. I got in at 35 years old and then um, a weird thing happened, though, man, I got into UT and for some reason, I just didn't want to do it. I, I don't know what it was. And I see yeah, Well, my mom passed away right when I got out. Uh, I had a whole I had two surgeries of my neck, my shoulder, because I, I got medically discharged from the Navy. It wasn't that I just got out. I got uh, medically discharged. I got uh, plates and screws in my neck back. My back's messed up. My shoulders messed up. But there's a whole bunch of stuff going on. I just didn't want to go to school, man. And uh and it, it was weird because, like I said, it was my dream school. I had everything paid for it. Mean, you can't ask for anything more. I was getting paid to go to school, even, you know, the post 9 11 GI Bill. But I just didn't want to do it. And I worked some engineering jobs. I worked at uh, uh, Samsung and some really good jobs, uh, really good paying, good benefits, all that kind of stuff. But I just, after, oh man, it was probably three or four years, I just didn't want to do engineering anymore. And then that's when our first daughter came along, uh, right around. What, what, what 2010 yeah 20 yeah we adopted her in 2013 uh she came around in 2010 uh, but the adoption we did a private adoption with her and it took three years and then right after that her brother and sister came onto the scene and so they're all related through blood uh they're uh, they're all uh, have the same mother uh the mother is actually related to me through marriage uh my dad remarried and uh so we wound up with all three of them and I was going through a lot. I really was. I had some PTSD issues that I hadn't dealt with. And uh, uh, I finally started going to counseling. And I was about a year into counseling when I just told my wife, I was like, I think I want to quit school and do stand up. She's like, what in the fuck are you talking about? You know, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, three kids, all three kids, all of them still shit in their pants, you know, and I want to quit a lucrative profession to go do five dollar gigs. <laughs> so, totally. It's kind of backwards. I should have done it the other way around, you know, but uh, so she gave me uh, three months to get booked. And she's like, you got three months to get booked or you got to go back to school. And so within a month, I was getting booked. And then in my first year, I was a semifinalist for Funniest Comic in Texas. And then I started getting on festivals and other stuff within my second, third year. And now I'm at year four and I'm touring and doing things that I want to do. And yeah, we're not quite at year four. It'd be year four in Jan- uh, July. But um uh, so finally starting to make decent money at it uh, and uh, producing shows, learning the ins and outs. Uh, it's just the biggest thing is, man, learning how to deal with the scenes, you know, how to navigate scenes. If I could give any advice to any comics just starting out, just yep. keep your nose down and just shut the fuck up. <laughs> just, yeah, just go in, do your set, make friends. Don't get involved in the drama. Stay away from the drama. It will do nothing but drag you down because... Whenever you're talking shit online, you might think you look cool and funny, but bookers are watching that conversation and they're not commenting, but they're looking at that. Con- My wife does it all the time. Uh, they're looking at that conversation and they're saying, you know what? I don't want to work with that dude. Why would I ever want to work with that dude? He's being a complete ass on online. Why would I want to work with that guy? So that is the best advice I could give any comic starting out, man. Just just stay away from it. And I know it can be hard sometimes, uh, but just stay away from it. 
so it's so incredibly depressing to try to do something with a career where there's all this crap going oh, on. Yeah. Oh no, I've always said that it, it, it amazes me that comedy is a field where your entire job is to make people laugh and have a good time, but it's filled with so many miserable fucks. <laughs> you know, I just I don't, I don't understand how that works. I really don't. I, I'll never understand that, man. But uh, yeah, yeah, a lot of them will stay at the open micro level, but uh, it's, uh, it's because they just don't know how to navigate uh, through all of that. And uh, the military helped me tremendously with uh, comedy. I've told everybody all the time that uh, there's so many parallels. You know, it's like with comedy, it's just like the military. What'd you do uh, today? I don't care what you did yesterday. Uh, you know, can you do it again today? Can you do it better? Can you? Are you okay with someone younger and you advancing faster than you? Are you okay taking advice from someone younger than you? You know, there's so many things with the military. That, and like I said, going in 27, everybody was younger than me and they all outranked me. So I had to learn to do that. And uh, it's really benefited me in comedy. It really has. And I started how, comedy when I was 63. So I know what you're oh, talking yeah. about. And the military skills do transfer. They do. They really do. They do. Uh, how to talk to people, how to deal with things, how to uh, not get rattled. You know, that's a big thing. You know, it's uh, I don't know how many times on stage, you know, you kind of get rattled by a heckler or something happens and it uh, changes the flow of the show, you know, and you got to know how to redirect and get right back into where you were going, you know, and uh, that takes time. It does. Uh, but I, I know the military helped me with that. It, it, it helps you realize what's going on and process it in your head. Okay, is this a big deal? Do I need to move? You know what I mean? It's just, and it's split, it's spontaneous. It's, it's not like a, you're sitting there trying to figure things out. It's really quick, but. Yeah, you and I both uh, have PTSD, you mentioned that you have it. And have you ever been on stage where someone triggers your PTSD by being very jolting? No, I can't say that that's happened. Uh, I want to, the, the biggest thing with me with the PTSD is the, uh, uh, you get in your head, you know, once you get in your head and you have, you shut down, uh, you have to, you have to talk to somebody, man. And if you don't talk to somebody, it's going to get worse. My counselor, uh, my VA counselor told me once, he's like, you can deal with this now or you can deal with it later. He's like, but you're going to deal with it. So, uh, he's like, but if you deal with it later, you're probably not going to like how the outcome comes out. And so, uh, going to counseling for three years was amazing for me. It helped. And then the thing is, it, I've always told my wife too, it's like the first six months of counseling, I hated it. I, I really did. I was like, this is stupid. Why am I? And, but for some reason I kept going back. I don't know. Why. And it was every two weeks. It wasn't like it was once a month or once a quarter. And I just kept going back and kept going back. And it seemed like right around six, seven months, it was like a switch went off, man. And everything started making sense. And yeah, he's one of the people that encouraged me to do stand up too, as my counselor. Uh, it, it wasn't like he was like, Oh, you should do stand up comedy. I told him I wanted to try it. And he was like, Yeah, give it a shot. You know, and because uh, I hate it when comics can't come up and they're like, My counselor said I should do stand up. It's like, Well, you need to punch your counselor. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> well, but, let's talk about the other people that encouraged you to do comedy besides your counselor. Who were the others? Oh, my wife, uh, but my wife, big time. She's she's my biggest fan, and my biggest critic. And I've told people all the time, you have to have a critic in your corner and someone that's not afraid to tell you what everybody else is afraid to tell you. You know, like a, the very first time that I headlined, man, I did uh, this place called Barrels and Amps out in Georgetown, Texas. And uh, it was the first time I was doing 45 minutes, first time I was headlining a show and it was packed. It was a packed room and everybody who went up before me killed. It was a really good show. And I went up for 45 and I, I destroyed for 45 minutes. I, I had one, I just a great set, man. And I left the stage and I walked right up to my wife and I was in still in that, you know, that days you're in when you have a great set, a killer set. And I walked up and I was like, what'd you think? She's like, well, you got two jokes that I've heard you do three times now that they haven't hit all three times. You need to drop those from your set. And I looked at her, I, was like, I looked at my note cards. I was like, there's 29 jokes in this 45 minute bit a set. And you remember the two that don't hit. She's like, yeah, you need to get rid of those. You know, it, was, it, it wasn't like she was even scared to tell me. She's like, you need to drop that shit. It's terrible. <laughs> you know, it's, it's That's bad. so great. So you have to have that in your corner. If you're going to be successful in comedy, you can't have a bunch of yes, men. You can't have a bunch of people telling you how great you are all the time. You know? and, and yeah. And you cannot get mad whenever someone gives you advice you don't like. You know, you have to, you have to process it. You have to deal with it. And if you don't agree with it, you can tell them you don't agree with it. Uh, but, you know, it's like the first rule of comedy. Don't be a dick. You know, yeah. it's, it's, it's the most simple rule in the world, but so many people don't understand it. <laughs> you know? I, get it. 
I'd like to explore something with you and Amy that I mentioned, uh, if you're comfortable, Amy and Shannon, yeah. is that you two are married. And one of my concerns is that there are a lot of people in comedy struggling to keep relationships alive because yeah. comedy can pull Shannon in one direction and Amy in another. You're doing everything to help his career in the background. He's getting all the attention. But you're the wife and you're the helpmate. And how do you how do you balance the professional and the personal life and make it work? It's a crazy business. Well, the thing is, uh, if you talk to comics in Austin, <laughs> she has a better rep in the scene than I do. Uh, there's a lot of because she produces shows and she pays comics. I just do jokes. Uh, so they like her a lot more than they like me. And uh, I tell people all the time that I go to Austin, they're like, oh, you're Amy's husband. I'm like, yeah, I tell jokes. I, I do stand up, you know, so. I'm likable. He's a jerk. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, what it comes down to is there's different re types in each relationship. I'm not one that needs to be in the spotlight. In fact, I hate being in the spotlight unless it comes to work. Um, I've worked in marketing and communications. I, I'm, I can do great at that, but getting on a stage and trying to tell jokes and trying to entertain people, especially hecklers, I'm not, I grew up in Chicago. I'm going to come off the stage. So I'm the last person that needs yeah. to tell a joke. She's going to do a reverse. <laughs> she's going to do the reverse. Will Smith. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. 100%. So I know that me being on stage is the last place I need to be because I'm one of those people, you say the wrong thing to me and I'm not in a professional work mindset. It's not going to end well. I am better at back behind the scenes telling comics like, hey, I've got a spot for you or yeah, this, how much it pays this this is how is much when you pays. need to be there. I'm yes. also great talking. You know, I, I like numbers. I like talking numbers. I like talking figures. I like doing the marketing side of stuff. I don't like dealing with drunk people unless it's to calm them down. Like I can, I work at a Navy bar when I met him. I can, yeah, I can make Navy drunk bar. people. Yeah. I can make drunk people call she's finally telling the kids that uh forever the kids would be like where did y'all meet and they're like oh we met on base like oh that's a goddamn lie we met at a navy bar <laughs> your mom was a shot girl at a navy bar <laughs> yes <laughs> you know that that's the kind of stuff i can deal with i'm but i'm also one of those people when you attack my family i'm i'm in attack mode um yeah. so I, that's something i've had to learn to do with being a producer because there's people that don't like shannon's that's, comedy and like well, to talk trash about it and it's like it's not great. the comedy they don't like they don't like it that i tell them the truth uh they just get, get really mad about that and uh yeah it's there's been a couple of times i've had to tell her to calm down you know and usually it's the other way around uh, i'm the one that she, she, she's always said and what i was talking about with the drama earlier this one right here is the one that told me from the beginning, would you stop commenting on stuff? Would you stop miss? So yeah, like I said, it's really easy to get involved in that. And, uh, from experience, don't do it. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it doesn't help. A lot of people treat comedy like it is a big party, but yeah. if this is something that you really want to do 100%, you and, it, and you're married, you need to support each other 100%. And treat it like a job. And treat it like a job. Yeah. What persona you put out there to the world is what people are going to see you as. If you go out just being cold hearted to everybody and just disrespectful, nobody's going to want to work with you or your husband or your wife. So it's just, it's a, it's a job. You can make friends at your job, but you also have to know how to treat people. You can't just yeah. be like, oh, I don't like you because you wore those shoes. No, and you worked with this person. <laughs> or you worked with this person. Because yeah. trust me, there's a lot of comedians that I will not book or work with because of jokes that they tell that I think is way over yeah, i wouldn't say the jokes do it it's the attitude after it's that uh and we've booked a lot of dark comics uh we have we have some friends in austin some of the darkest comics i know <laughs> and uh they're great people and we love working with them man but if you come off stage if you're a dark comic on the stage and you come off starting to keep talking to me like turn it off <laughs> you know, just turn it off Talk to me like a person, you know, and it's a. Or as yes. a producer, if the room has rules about do not tell these kind of jokes because yeah. we have people yeah, that it can too. trigger, don't go do those jokes trying to push the envelope. When I tell you from the jump, hey, they said no rape or pedophilia jokes. Please do not tell these jokes in your set. Please take them out. You know, don't go yeah. on the stage and do a whole five minute bit about it because I'm going to turn off your mic and you're going to. Yeah. I've That's had comics thing. come off the stage and get in my face and try to fight me over that. And yeah. It's ridiculous. These are grown men getting in my face and 
I'm not the one. Yeah. No, she called oh. me and it's like, I'm about to go to the car and get a crowbar. I was like, no, you're not. No, <laughs> that's a bad idea. Don't do that. No, don't do that. Let's give and take. We ground <laughs> each other. Um, I let him have the spotlight. Oh, you let me. <laughs> I let you, you have let the, me spotlight. Have the spotlight. <laughs> yeah, we flipped a coin at the we flipped a coin at the beginning. Okay, I guess I'll be the stand-up comic. You can be the producer. Then I won the head. I won the coin toss. <laughs> we all we all know who really runs everything. <laughs> yeah, yeah the, the kids. One hundred percent. I love the way you have it figured out, and your personalities are so awesome. No, thank you. Oh, thank you. And thank you for all that you're doing, because I really mean it. There's so many comedians out there that need stage time and oh, you're yeah. working your buns off to get them on stages and you're being well, that, fair about it. So that was one of the really one of the things that when we started turn two is one of the goals that we had was to help comics get stage time that never get stage time. Cause I, I ran into it like starting you, you probably know exactly what I'm talking about. I started at 43, but when you start as an older comic, they don't book you. They, right. they just don't it, and it's not that the, it, it, I don't want to use the ageism thing but it it kind of is you know and, and it's not that they're doing it on purpose it's just they're a bunch of 20 year olds and they all hang out together and they all drink together and they all fuck each other and they all go out all the time and like, you know I don't know sorry it's just, I, I'm not supposed to cuss I guess but that's what I mean they all know each other and they all hang out and that's why they book each other and that's why they all run in the same crowds but when you're in your 40s starting off and you have three kids at home and you have a wife at home and you have you know going to school at UT that kind of stuff I don't have time to go out and party I got to go do the mic and I got to go back home you know and it's, so it takes time and so she started booking I wasn't getting booked so and, I went and found rooms yeah so she went and, and found rooms. I started booking comics that I seen were getting booked because I noticed that a lot of women weren't getting booked. A mm -hmm. lot of people over the age of 30 were not getting booked. People a lot of, of people of uh, minorities were not getting yeah. booked. And exactly. I just went after those comics because we're not all doing shows down by the college. The rooms that I book for, they are usually 30 and up families. Yeah. Their moms, dads, grandparents. It's middle America. Yeah, yeah middle America. Yeah, this is basically uh, Joe American and I mean, wife, you know. It's if a, I'm going to a comedy show, I'm not a comedian. I know that I don't want to go listen to some 22-year-old talk about her dating apps. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, don't get me wrong. There is some comedians that can work those in, and they're hilarious. Yeah. But there's some that it's like, I don't care who sent you a dick pic today. <laughs> I <Thank> really <laughs> <you. laughs> Exactly. Yeah, it's crazy out there. Like, when... I was in Portland, Oregon, which is pretty much the LGBTQ group of comedy and nothing against them, but I'm not. I'm straight as an arrow, white, older, part Jewish in an environment that really didn't want me in my own hometown. <laughs> it was killing me. And I, when, when I left Portland and came to Vegas, all of a sudden I'm around comedians that are my age that are serious yeah. about you know, straight up comedy, not you know, no agenda. There's no background yeah. agenda for the show. You know, it's like comedy. And yeah, like, no, I love, yeah. Her. I love her. I always love performing in Vegas or anywhere around that area, man. It's always a blast. It's uh, I've gotten more drunk women in Vegas, I think, than anywhere else. <laughs> but, uh, all, I those, long all those parties they're having before they yeah. get married and they all yeah, go in a gaggle. <laughs> yep. Exactly. In fact, Not. we also, as turn two, um, I run this with a, a female comedian who I became really good friends with. We teamed up on it. It's called the G Spot Comedy Showcase. We book all females and the LGBTQ community, and we put on shows where we have sponsors that gives us sex toys, lotions, lingerie, mm -hmm. gift cards, and um, you know, there's there's something for everybody. It's just mm -hmm. finding the right room for the right person and knowing when that room's not a good fit for you is the part. I've had comics get so mad at me when I tell them, hey, this room's not going to be a fit for you. Well, how do you know what's going to be a fit? Because it's my room. <laughs> I know what works. Yeah, got, That's you your know. job to know. Yeah. And they need to take, they need to just take your advice and not get offended. I, it's yeah. you're doing us a favor if you tell us it's not the right room. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Like, hey, this is this is the kind of material they like. So if you can get yourself a good 15 minutes in with this material, send it to me and I'll let you know, hey, this will kill. Let's do yeah. it. I mean, I um right before COVID, I had a comedian who I would book more in our rowdier rooms and he would kill there. He wasn't getting booked um, anywhere else. He wasn't either. getting yeah, he wasn't getting booked anywhere else. But I'm one of those people I want to give people a room that they'll do great in. I don't want to put them in a room that they are gonna feel like their soul was sucked out of it. Um 
and uh, they, I had I have this really great room that is again middle America it, it's borderline red and blue you know I know what fits there it's your 35 and up parents I told him you just want to be a great fit for this room and he said well who do you think you are the mother of comedy <laughs> and I'm like yeah if you're okay, booking, you are and then, my rooms? Yeah. Um, then, he, then he said she was racist. And yeah. All kinds of other well, things. I was a so, racist. A ra yeah, he spelled it wrong. So he didn't really call her a racist. He called her a racist because uh, he misspelled <laughs> it. Yeah. But if you ask any comedian in Austin, I'm probably one of the, uh, I book more minorities than anybody else. Yeah. Yeah, you do. Uh, it's it's funny. Uh, we have a And I don't do it on purpose. No, we have a friend named Roderick. I don't know if you ever met Roderick McDaniel. No, he's, he's out of Austin. He's a Navy vet too. He's a good, he's one of our best friends, but uh, he's a black comic. And he told me once, he's like, your wife has put more black men to work than Obama. And I never do it on purpose. No, she I, just, do it on purpose I look no. funny. I don't look at, you know, and I know that sounds like, so like, oh, whatever. But no, when I'm doing my lineups, I'm like, okay, who haven't I booked? Who's funny? And that's how I do my lineups because it's not about who knows who. Because oh, if you it, always do that, then you're always going to be left behind. Well, it's not a bro case. Is what you exactly? Yeah, it's, I always not, it's a showcase, not a bro case, Shannon. <laughs> he hit me up multiple times, like, "Hey, this is this person's really funny. We're uh, we're you know making connections." And I'm like, "Okay, well, send me a video." He's like, "I'm vouching for him." I'm like. And that doesn't mean yeah. anything for me. I need to see a video. Yeah, you forgot the DJ, remember? Yeah. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> we get the DJ, and we ended up having to hire some <laughs> some guy who went by oh, what DJ was it? Moose Knuckle or yeah, some DJ shit? Yeah, Moose it was the weirdest thing ever. And he shows up. This guy looks like he just came from a kid's birthday party. Where he was and, making uh, animals. It was weird. <laughs> and uh, he brought me up with uh, I forgot what he was playing. It was I think it was Leonard Skinner. No, was it was YMCA. Was it? Yeah. Uh, I was, oh yeah, because I'm Navy. Yeah. yeah we went to YMCA I at come, a well, biker bar. Yeah. So I come <laughs> up and he stops the music and I start my set and the music starts again. And I was like, okay. And I look back at him. He stops the music. And then so I go into my set again and it starts again. And I was like, dude, are we waiting for the guitar solo? What the hell are we doing? You know, come on, man. So yes, he's not allowed to book any shows, no <laughs> DJs. Um he can tell me which where he thinks a good showcase will be, but at the end of the day, like I tell him, you're a comedian. Your job is just to stand up there and look pretty. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, more. Yes, and smile more. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh! So, what is it the two of you want to accomplish to leave a legacy behind for your children, in on and off stage? My thing is, is our kids have had a hard life before they were even, you know, able to walk. Um, being born to a drug addicted mother, bio mother. Um, our oldest was kidnapped when she was three months by her bio mom. I mean, so much stuff that they went through. So our biggest thing is showing them that you don't have to do what everybody else does. You are loved by who you are and what you are. Our oldest one came out to us that she's a lesbian. And you know, we're like, we told her you're 11. You have a right to be who you mm -hmm. want. You'll probably change your mind in a couple of years. Cause we all do. We, none of us know what we're doing at 11. But we support you, but don't think you're going to date. Yeah, no. <laughs> our whole thing is, is letting our kids know to be who they are, to speak their truth, mm. and to do what makes them happy. I, you know, I'm a big advocate for college, but we also tell the kids 100%, if it's not making them happy, then find something that's going to make, your ha make you happy and something that you're good at. We're not those people that are telling our kids, oh, you have to make a lot of money and you have to live your life this way because you're just going to make your children miserable. No, no. When I told my son how much baseball players make, he was like, really? <laughs> I was like, yeah. My son is, um, he is nothing like either one of us, even though we've raised him since he was a newborn. Mm -hmm. I tell everybody he is a little um, future Republican in training because he yeah, is- I have a bit about it, yeah. <laughs> he has more money underneath his mattress than his dad does in his wallet. No, that little dude <laughs> saved up. We told him he had to save up to get a Nintendo Switch and he asked how much. We said $310. The little dude saved up 150 bucks. Yeah, within uh, he, like three yeah. weeks. Well, no, it was longer than that. But uh, he was putting tooth fairy money back, birthday money. Uh, anytime he'd get a dollar, anything. And one day- We caught him trying to pull his teeth out before they were ready to come yeah, out. so he could get a switch. So finally we were like, you know what? He's got 150. We'll just, cut, we'll pay the rest. You're good, okay. dude. You're good. He was also <laughs> like telling his sister, oh, you don't want to wash the dishes? I'll wash the dishes if you give me your allowance this week. Yeah. Is it? And I'm just wow. like- He's like, you know the show. Dude. I, I, I've made this reference before and a lot of people don't get it. He's he's Michael Keaton. Uh, not Michael yes. Keaton. Yeah, he, that's who he is. He's, he's uh, the Michael Keaton. Keaton on uh, yeah. was it family family, family ties? ties yeah 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 no um 
the funny thing is, is both my girls are all about being in the limelight, like their dad. Uh, my son is more of the, I'm going to sit back here until, until I want to be the class clown, but no, I got to feel it. <laughs> I think what's going to happen, the oldest is going to be a roast comic. The middle one's going to be a singer and the brother's going to be the manager controlling all the money. Yep. And that's what's going to happen. Yes. Cause right. my oldest can, she is 11 years old. And there's times that I'm like, I'm about to duct tape this child to a wall. <laughs> yeah. She is. Her comeback, she's savage. You know, she's she, savage. She is so mean. She <laughs> made my dad double look at her like, I did not, you just, you, you said what to me? Yeah. <laughs> like, I'm like, oh. good. She's yeah. also, I mean, our kids, the, <laughs> we have taken them to the women marches since they started. Um, in kindergarten, my oldest got in trouble and we got called to the school because the kindergarten teacher had a song. She was very old school. Um, and it's Texas about boys fly your rocket ships, girls twirl around like ballerinas. And she said, I don't want to twirl. I want to fly a rocket ship. And she's like, well, this is a direction song you have to do. And my daughter's like, well, then I'm just going to sit right here and not move. So we got called to school. And I'm like, well, she's right. Yeah, she basically, uh, a couple of kids sat down with her too, because they agreed with her. So she basically organized a sit-in in kindergarten. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, my middle child, uh, Shy, when she was, and we changed her name because her first name was ridiculous. It was like Saika or something. Yeah, and so we, we, uh, we just started yelling names at her one day until one, she liked one. So it was, she got named Cheyenne and um, I don't remember. Like oh, that. yeah, I do. I don't remember. <laughs> yes, because you wanted to name her something else. You, you wanted want to name her Shannon. No, yeah, I wanted to name her Shannon. <laughs> I wanted to name her Shannon because I wanted to be able to call my daughter Junior. I and, thought that'd so be we cool. I thought that. that'd be really cool, no. man. No, no, and I wanted to name her Jolene because I'm obsessed with Dolly Barton. I wanted to name her Anastasia. Yes, and Anastasia. Um, in fact, here they come. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> she started a um, a sit in. Huh? For, yeah, and about for, no, Starla did the thing, um, but she, they were supposed to go to gym and she didn't want to go to gym. She wanted to have this book read to her by her teacher. So she got her entire class of 23 students to sit down and refuse yeah. to leave until or the teacher read line. the book. She, she oh. got every single child. So yeah, even her, her preschool teacher said she is either going to grow up to be in a great politician one day. Or she's gonna be an amazing mafia boss. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, what's the one thing in all your children and one thing in all your comedy that you two do that is the biggest thing you feel that you've accomplished? Hi, Mom. Uh, Confidence in Shannon and my kids. My hi, kids Dad. are very confident. And Shannon has... Um, <laughs> she's one of them. <laughs> hi. <laughs> As you can see, they're all. Yeah, they, they've never met a stranger. No, no. Uh, no, I'm just making, just making them, like she said, making them confident and telling them not to be afraid to try new things. I tell them all the time that uh, when we got, we went, uh, I had some shows down in New Orleans, and uh, I brought, I was able to bring Amy and the kids with me, and uh, we uh, went downtown and got to see a parade and everything else. And uh, when I was in the Navy, one of my my biggest thing was if I went somewhere new, I wanted to try a local dish. I didn't want to eat, I didn't want to eat McDonald's in Hong Kong. You know, it just didn't make any sense. You know, so. I always told them to try something new and uh, we had it. They got to try alligator and uh, my, our middle child, she loved it. She thought it was great. The other two, they weren't too big fans of it, man. Oh, you loved it? I don't it remember that. Good. Was, it tastes yeah, good. Was, yeah, and uh, so they had a parade going on while we were there. So they got to see a parade. That's what I wanted. I wanted to, I wanted them to experience New Orleans, but then the parade's coming and there's this guy at the front. He's probably about 6'2". He's a big guy. But he had this big hat on with a feather on it, all red. He had a cane. He had stilts on, too. So he's even taller than, you know, six or whatever. But uh, Amy's standing there with the kids. And I was off to the side. And all of a sudden, I hear my son just screaming at the top of his lungs. And I turn around and ask what happened. Uh, apparently, the guy reached down to tell my son, hey, come dance with me, you know, and bring him into the parade. And my son freaked out because my wife, Amy, was like, yeah, go. And but I was like, you got to consider how much that how confusing that has to be for him, because we tell him all the time, never go with strangers, never go with strangers. And then the strangest looking person in the world walks up and you tell, oh, yeah, go with him. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. Well, let's go back to the tour that you're doing mm -hmm. and let the bookers and agents that come mm -hmm. on here and look at the videos give a pitch to letting you come into their clubs along the way if you will you guys like, uh, we well, you. please book him because i need a break from him tearing everything up in our new house 
and I'm I need to be able things. I'm fixing things. He's breaking them. things. They're fixed. And I need a chance to actually get my kids to do their chores where mm -hmm. dad thinks that it's fun to tell them, oh, let's go swimming. Oh, let's, let's make cookies. Instead of, hey, you need to put your laundry away and do the dishes. So please, please book him. I need him out of my hair. I love him, but him being gone makes the heart fonder. Yes. <laughs> All right, I will leave it to you. I got to get All these right. kids. Yep. It was nice meeting you. Nice meeting you too, Amy. Thank you. Uh, what the a biggest pistol. thing. Yeah, there she is. Yes. <laughs> now, the biggest thing with uh, my stand up is that I try to make it a mix of uh, basically everything I've gone through. I always say that I got, I have like four major chapters in my life to where it was like I was going one direction and it was just all of a sudden just a 180 in a totally different direction. And then another 180 a couple of years down the five, 10 years down the road. And I, uh, you know, I went from, uh, you know, uh, getting in trouble with the law, doing drugs, that kind of stuff, to being in the military, and then after the military, being a dad and being in engineering, and then after that, going into stand up. And so it's always something that's just completely different every time. And I, I, care, I talk about a lot of that in my stand up. I, uh, I try not to talk about my kids too much. I mean, kids are kind of, I have a my friend in Australia, he told me, he's like, you didn't adopt three kids, you hired three writers. You know, so, <laughs> so I, I try not to stay with them too much I, I do have a lot of material on them I have material on my wife and our marriage and navy material and some stuff from when I was growing up so I try to mix it up hi shy that's another one that's Cheyenne that's the older one or the middle that's middle, middle. Um, yeah but now that's uh basically I have about I have a little over an hour's worth of material that's the oldest one I I have about an over an hour's worth of material um uh, I'm still and one of the reasons I want to do these I like doing these runs is uh I can find somebody that has 30 minutes and I can do an hour and I'm trying to get the hour exactly like I want it I have it in the order that I want it I'm still working on tags and you know trying not to curse as much that's a big time just you know seven years in the navy it kind of bleeds through sometimes but it's just uh that's the main thing with it i want to um, my, my plans are to try to record an album at the end of the year at the beginning of next year it's not really a rush um uh, and i'm still working on making a following and getting out there and you know getting out more and uh, i would like to do some more club work that's the goal for this year is to get more club work but uh, you know what i like about your hour goal for a special is that you're not just sitting around writing material, putting out your own special every week. You're really taking your material and testing it across the country, oh, yeah. which which is how it's supposed to be. Yeah, exactly. That's how, that's how I was taught whenever I was coming up in comedy, talking about my first time. And like I said, it was only four years ago, but the people I talked to about it, they would tell me that exact same thing. I, uh, my friend Jay Whitecotton in Austin, I asked him about it. And I said, uh, how do you know when you're ready? He's like, well, you kind of don't but you do he's like you need to go on the road you need to do this material i said i have the material that i want when should i record he's like you need to go on the road for a year with that material and you need to see if it works and you need to tweak it and you need to drop stuff maybe add stuff he's like just because you have an hour doesn't mean you need to record an hour he's like you need it to be good you need it to be memorable you need it to be uh to the point and i was like well the thing is though once i record the album i gotta burn all that material right and he's like well, it's kind of how many people buy the album. Only four people buy it. You can do that material for the rest of your life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, boy, so. that would really suck if you had your first album sold out and you had to throw it all away and start fresh with a whole new. But that's what a lot of comics that's have done for decades. Yeah, that's how it works. I have about an hour and a half, and I did that on purpose because when I got to an hour, I was like, what if I did have to burn this material? What am I going to do? You know, and so I started working on other stuff. So I got about another half hour that I throw out every now and then uh, just to tweak it and work on it a little bit. And that'll be the stuff that I'll work on after the album's out. But uh, I want to have at least half an hour so I can feature uh, even then. I don't want to go back to five minute open mics and, uh, you know, doing uh, six minute guest spots because that's all you got. You know, there's only six minutes. I don't mind doing guest spots like this coming up. But I don't right when I said that, I was like, oh, shit, there's a guest spot coming up. It's, <laughs> <laughs> I meant no disrespect with that. I don't mind doing guest spots. I just don't want to get to the point to where that's all I can do because that's all the material that I have. Yes, absolutely. Well, it's going to be so great to have you on the show. Oh, definitely. Yeah. And it's going to be such a great event. I have a stack of stuff over there that I've gotten donations to give out as prizes. Oh, yeah. And um, I even got a dress designer that's going to make something in red, white, and blue for me to wear. Oh, that's awesome. 
That's cool, man. So I'm excited about it. It's the first time I've seen a casino club, a major club, give a rip about a military holiday for the really? veteran armed for first time. I've yeah. I've pitched the idea all over. You know, mm. like what about a Veterans Day? What about you know this? What about Fourth of July? Never. Nobody wanted to yeah. touch it. You probably well, we do. Uh, well, one of the things that you mentioned in the the write up that I have is the Chato Foundation, and that's a group out of uh, Central Texas, and uh, we love doing. We do uh, fundraiser. We haven't done one in a while. We need to do another one, but uh, we do fundraisers for them to where all proceeds go to them. Uh, and we even tell the comics when they're coming in, hey man, there's no pay on this gig. I'll, I'll throw you some gas money if, if you need it, but there's no pay on this gig because 100% of the profits go to the Chad O. And uh, Chad O is a uh, foundation, is a foundation for veterans that need to get counseling that don't want to lose their security clearance or their active duty and they don't want their command to know about it, that kind of stuff. They're only in um, Texas right yeah, now. Yeah, they're only in Texas right now, but uh, they started because uh, Chad O, uh, his... Uh, the chat, well, Chad O was in the yeah, Marine Corps. He was a Marine. He, he did two tours overseas. The first tour he came back and he told his command, I'm I'm having nightmares. I think I have PTSD. They told him, mm, you're faking it. Didn't get him any wow. kind of help or anything. They sent him back on his next deployment. He came back. He finally got help. He went to check in. They were supposed to have a bed for him. They didn't have a bed for him, but they gave him all the medications they would give somebody with PTSD. They sent him back to his barracks. He taught the medicine. He never woke up. Yeah, anyway, go. So Dad O, who's an amazing man, oh, yeah, awesome. um, he, he is just, for all the trauma that he has had to live through and everything that he does for veterans, you would think that he would, you know, if I lost my child to PTSD and something that but military who, you know, they say when they take your children, they're going to protect your children. You know, it, he's just, he is just one of the most sweetest men and all of Chad's friends that are helping run this organization. Yeah, they're they're great, amazing yeah, people. It's, yeah. That's uh, um, they have a uh, they have a licensed psychologist on staff that uh, she usually charges I think you said around over yeah two fifty an hour and she, working with them she only charges them sixty dollars an hour so and the veterans if you ever use them you don't pay anything uh, the foundation pays for all that and uh, so the dad he uh, he took you know he, the death benefit instead of spending it he took that money and started that organization. So we absolutely love working with them. I'll work with them till the, if I, as long as I do comedy, I will do stuff for them. They're, they're amazing people and what they do is, is awesome. I have, a, I have a, two friends that I've actually referred to them and they've helped them out. So it, uh, they're a great organization. So are they on Facebook where I can share their yeah. stuff? Yeah, they are. It's uh, the Chad O Foundation. I, I will kill his name if I try to say it. It's Austin Longer. Or, but uh, they, yeah, but it's pronounced. Uh, if you go and look on Facebook and you yeah, just type you in the up, Chad O Foundation, you'll be able to pull up their story and everything. Yeah, it's a. Uh, I think the cover picture is uh, Chad, and it's uh, him in his Marine uniform. Uh, so. And another one that we are going to probably start helping with soon is we just a brewery that we just landed in Wisconsin. They do the honor honor flights. They raise money for that. Yeah. Um, in fact, they have. They just came out with this beer. It's the Never Forgotten, and all proceeds go, I, I believe is what he said, all proceeds will be going to Never the Never Forgotten, <laughs> whatever. Never Forgotten. <laughs> Shut is up. That, is that the Southern <laughs> version? This is a Never Forgotten bear. We might have to turn off the camera so I can beat, <laughs> turn off the camera so I can beat him for a few minutes. Um, <laughs> but no, it's, there, it's for the honor flights, and um, if y'all don't know about the honor flight, it's where they send veterans from to, to their memorial to the memorial yeah it's a uh, it, they've uh, i think they've advanced they've uh changed it now to where they they don't because they were just doing world war ii vets i think they do they're everybody doing, now they're doing vietnam and stuff yeah they right do now. everything now every war yes so great organization um you know but it's it's really cool can they gave us a bunch of these that we'll be handing out at shows so yeah. That's so super. Send me send me the information on the beer and I'll okay. go find Chad O, okay? Right. Will do. <laughs> super. You guys are so awesome. I can't wait to meet you in person on May 21st at LA Comedy Club when we're all on a show together at the, at, at midnight. We have to take a nap before we go. <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, it's a midnight show. I thought yeah. it was at 10 o'clock. I'm, I thought it was, I'm, nah, I'm, glad you, I'm glad you said something. I showed up at 10 and been like, oh, damn it. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's a midnight show. I hope I'm right. That's what I've been, <laughs> I've been telling everybody. I need to talk to our babysitter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you guys have been absolutely delightful. And oh, so fun. 
Shannon, where would you like people to follow you on social media the most? A couple uh, places. Probably, probably TikTok. I've been trying to build that. And I, I, I feel disgusting saying I have a TikTok at 46. I really feel like I need to take a shower after saying that. But his kids love it. Yeah, the kids <laughs> love it. But, and I love it too because I get to throw stuff at him. But on my TikTok, <laughs> yeah, there's a video of her throwing a water bottle at me on TikTok. Uh, but uh, I... Uh, I, I put my some of some small short stand up clips on there and post tour dates that kind of stuff and I also uh, I just started doing it about four months ago but that's the one that I want to get the best uh, on because Instagram is in interesting Facebook is a interesting place to say the least is uh, my friend has a joke about it he, he calls Facebook uh, Internet Florida. <laughs> so. But uh, no, I, uh, that's Pat Soroy out of Austin he's he's fucking hilarious but uh, no, I have. Uh, I, I wanted to push the TikTok and it's just Shannon Mugridge comedy is all it is. Okay, perfect. Yeah, well, we're going to be doing, we're going to be doing more skits with the kids and a few other ideas that I have too. So it's just, uh, the kids are excited to be in it. They keep giving me ideas for TikTok. So my daughter said uh, she wanted to do one where her and uh, Amy got into it and then they kind of glance around the room at each other. And then all of a sudden Michael Jackson's beat it comes on. And she was like, it'll be funny. And then mom can start hitting me. I was like, no, 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 no. We're not doing child abuse on TikTok. <laughs> That's not happening. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Did you hear about those parents that drug along their four-year-old on a, a marathon? No. Oh, now yeah, I did. They made the kid run the whole damn thing. Yes, I did see a, a clip about that. I was going to read that, and I didn't, man. So. And they got a yeah. rope. You know, one of those kid ropes. You're not getting oh away. <laughs> oh no, it was all the kids. Like lampoon, that glass of lampoons when they drag the grandma or the dog behind them. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks a lot. Is there anything in closing that I didn't ask you that you would like to say to people who love comedy or to young comedians? Anything? No, I mean, I can't. I, like I said, the, the drama thing is the biggest thing that I tell younger comics and have somebody that you can bounce things off of. They'll be honest with you. Uh, never be scared to try something that you've always wanted to try. Yeah, never be afraid to do it. Uh, like Because Shannon's first open mic, he almost left. He almost mm -hmm. didn't go up at Cap City. And yeah. I told him if I didn't come out to sit there for two hours and listen to a bunch of other people. No, nah, what happened was <laughs> I realized she had the car keys and so I couldn't leave. <laughs> You guys are hilarious. You should go on stage together. <laughs> <laughs> Shannon, I don't think Amy would want to, but you guys are hilarious together. Yeah. Well, I've told her before we could be the next uh, Gracie and uh, George. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for the time, and we'll see you oh, May you. 21st. And you, yes, you bookers and agents, get a hold of Shannon McGraw. Mug, 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 Ridge. I see the A and I mess it up. Yeah, I know. That's where it messes everybody up. And the thing is, when we, uh, we've traced the family tree back and whenever we were uh, the family, I don't remember where they came from, but uh, Sweden or some shit. I always, everybody always asked me, where's Mugridge from? And I was like, Texas. I don't know. But, uh, but apparently when we first came over, it was R I D G E. And so they changed the spelling, but they kept saying it the same way because we're from Texas and that's what we do with words in Texas. Well, in closing, I would like to say, please tell Willie Nelson I've loved him forever. <laughs> <laughs> like every other woman on the planet. <laughs> hey, he's awesome. He is. Yeah, my mom was very big. My mom met him in the 70s and uh, they he went and had lunch with her at a restaurant or uh, she says restaurant, I think it's a strip club. I don't know. But uh she said that uh, she used to always tell everybody she ate Willie's pickle in the 70s. And uh, but what happened was they were eating and he offered her a bite of her burger. And when she took a bite of his burger, all she got was bun and pickle. And but she didn't say anything because it was Willie Nelson. But then uh, 25 years later, I started working for him and got to meet him. And so it was kind of full circle kind of thing. And I got to bring her to a concert and had backstage passes and he kissed her on the cheek and she about melted. <laughs> she was, it was awesome. You know, my mom was always really outspoken, really like you'd nothing rattled her and Willie Nelson kissed her on the cheek and that was it. <laughs> that was it. That's so great. Well, thank you once again, Amy and Shannon Mugridge for the wonderful <laughs> interview. And we'll see you May 21st at the LA Comedy Club at midnight with Leah Mendez's show. Yes, ma'am. We'll see you there. It was great talking to you.
Great talking to you, Shannon. Bye. Right. Bye, Amy. Bye -bye.